Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the University Francisco de Viterbo to the presentation of the book 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos. I am sure that we are all going to enjoy this event that has uh, led to so much expectation and the words from his author that is going to be introduced and interviewed by Cayetana Álvarez de Toledo. Before giving the floor to his publisher, I would like to give you some logistic information regarding Twitter. You can follow it through um, at ufumadrid.s and the hashtag PeterCerned at the UFV. The password for the Wi-Fi is Zona Wi-Fi Wi-Fi UFV. And for those of you who haven't been able to be here face to face, you will be able to follow it via streaming uh, ufv.edu.edu in uh, on YouTube. So, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to the publisher, Oriad. Hello, I'm going to be very brief. Firstly, in the name of Planeta and Ángeles Aguilera, who is the publishing responsible and all our group, I would like to thank you, the University Francisco de Vitoria, for hosting this event and also admiration. They've organized this event with great efficiency and very little time. And the success is visible in this room, in the other rooms. I would like to thank the university and personally Maria Lacalle and Daniel Salas, the dean and vice dean. I would also like to uh, thank Cayetana for uh, offering to present this event. She's a doctor in history by the University of Oxford. She's a member of Parliament. She also will hopefully be an author for Planeta. And due to her tasks, uh, her activities, she works frequently as an interviewer. And I think uh, she did an excellent interview in El Mundo to Jordan Peterson uh, in February and uh, helped get uh, spread the knowledge regarding this excellent uh, personality here in Spain. And finally, I would like to thank Dr. Peterson. His book uh, makes Planeta more noble. Uh, we are very proud to have him as one of our authors. We will also publish his previous book shortly. Hopefully we will be publishing many more books. It's been an honor to have him here in Spain. He would like to thank him warmly because he's had a lot of interviews today and uh, thank you for his participation in this event. Hopefully you will enjoy it. Good night, good evening. First of all, I would like to thank the University Francisco de Vitoria for organizing this event. Thank you to Planeta, the publishing house, for their invitation and the participation in this interview face to face. We met each other a few months ago in February uh, via Skype. And thank you, of course, to all of you and to all the people who have not been able to access this room and are um, in another room. I'm going to start um, asking Dr. Peterson a very brief question. I'm wearing red lipstick tonight, something which I don't often do. Does that mean anything? Well, let's see. Is it on? Hmm? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, it means, from a biological perspective, is that you're enhancing signals of youth and fecundity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and health. Hmm. So um, it also means, I suppose, to some degree, that you're acting in accordance with a set of cultural culturally determined norms because it's not behavior that's outside the norm to present yourself in that manner in a relatively formal or professional situation. So it's a strange yeah. admixture of both of those things. Thank you. Why did I ask Dr. Peterson this? Um, because 
he is, um, he is making a very important case um, defending nature and the impact of biology on human conduct, on human interest, on human choices, against that big movement which we call social constructionism. And um, nature has become something politically incorrect. Facts and science are being called reactionary, alt-right, fascist, sometimes in Spain. And um, I'm just going to make a very brief intro to explain, taking the advantage of the fact that this is being streamed worldwide, that um, problems that are very uh, acute in the US or in Canada uh, also take place here, also happen in Europe, also happen in Spain. Sometimes we arrive with a certain, they arrive with a certain delay in Spain, but that doesn't mean that Spain is different or immune to those problems. Identity politics is one of the biggest problems we have in Spain. Not only radical gender politics, radical feminism, but also ethnicity, ethnic politics, or alleged ethnic politics, nationalism. And in the same way that radical feminists call you a bad woman or a semi-woman, if you don't totally agree with the way they see the world or the way they expect us to think, choose, and speak, same happens with nationalism in Spain. And um, since we're in the middle of this very big wave of identity politics in Europe and in Spain particularly, it's such an extraordinary good moment to have a conversation with Dr. Peterson, who has, is putting, shedding light on this and also uh, fighting a very difficult battle, um, defending the individual and individual responsibility against collectivism and defending that balanced view of nature and social construction against those who only believe in social construction. And the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, his book, because that's what we're here for. We're here for his book and selling lots of books. He's already sold, I think, 12 million copies in many different countries, and it's the first time it's been published in Spanish, and we hope many millions will be sold, not only in Spain, but in Latin America. And I want to ask him, um, why is this book such an immense, huge success? Because anybody who might read it, I've read it first in English and now in Spanish, there's something very basic and common sense about many things that you say. It's almost what my grandmother would have taught me, which she did, probably. Uh -huh. Grandmother's advice, with a bit of Jungian covering and a bit I of neuroscience. I could have called it that. Grandmother's advice Grandmother's with a Jungian advice. covering. Grandpa Peterson's <laughs> advice. <laughs> so why, why is it such a success? Is our society such an enormous mess that a book like this with such common sense advice is such a huge bestseller? Well, I knew when I wrote the rules and then selected this 12 that I was writing rules that were in some sense commonplace. Mm -hmm. But the fact that rules are commonplace doesn't mean that the real reason, reasons that the rules exist are obvious. It just means that there's developed a cultural consensus around them for a very long time. And the problem with that is that when they're challenged, it isn't necessarily the case that people have an articulated defense at hand. So, for example, if someone puts you on the spot and they say, well, defend marriage. It's like, well, people have been assuming that marriage is the appropriate way forward with regards to uh, permanent relationships for 2,000 years. I thought we already agreed on that. I don't have a fully developed, articulated philosophy of marriage at hand. And that doesn't mean that the fact that you question it proves I'm ignorant. It just means that there are things that we accept as self-evident because of their depth and that we're not necessarily in possession of the philosophical rationale for their existence. So I'm providing the philosophical rationale. And it's layered, right? Because people think in narrative terms, so I provide a narrative rationale that verges on the religious, and then they think philosophically, so there's a philosophical rationale, and there's a political rationale, and there's a, a 
an attempt to take all of those abstract levels and then make them concrete and practical. And so that's all necessary to orient people. Part of it too is that like there's a there's a there's a world view that that exists underneath this book. And it's a mythological it's a mythologically informed world view. And it's a comprehensive view in some sense. It it doesn't it doesn't leave anything major out. And so there's a balance in it that shines through the chapters, let's say. And it reminds people of what they know, but they don't know how to say. And so people find that a great relief. You know, for example, I talk to my audiences about the fact that one of the fundamental religious truths is that life is suffering and that that's tainted and complicated by malevolence. And everyone knows that. There isn't a person on the planet that, that is ignorant of that in some fundamental sense, unless they're both naive and terrified of having their naivety destroyed. And so it's actually a relief to people to hear, oh, I, okay, so that's the fundamental condition. Well, now what? And, and so I'm trying to explain now what? Once you accept that as a primordial fact, let's say, you don't sh throw up your hands in despair. There's the next move in the game. And, well, and we can talk more about that, but that's the beginning of it. But that beginning would be, I mean, that's in a, in a very old debate between liberalism and Rousseau. If the world is a dark place and it takes institutions and individuals to sort it out, what's, what's so new about this? Well, I, I wouldn't claim necessarily that there is something fundamentally new about it. Um, one thing I've done that that it's a matter of depth of articulation, I would say. Because you can know things that you don't know you know. In fact, we know all sorts of things that we don't know we know. And it's helpful to lay an articulated level of representation on top of that because it brings things, it brings things psychologically into harmony. And so lots of people act out things that they don't say they believe and, and vice versa. And that puts them in a state of psychological confusion. Um, one of the things that I've been suggesting to my audiences is that because life is dark and because you can make it darker and especially if you're suffering beyond your capacity to bear it and you become bitter as a consequence, which is a highly probable outcome, that you need to discover a meaning that offsets the catastrophe and forestalls the malevolence and that that's actually discoverable. It's not something you invent, it's not a secondary consequence of your rationality. It's something fundamental about the structure of the world and that most of that meaning will be found in the voluntary acceptance of heavy responsibility and the heavier the better. So it's a strange thing because the disease is finitude and mortality and 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 what that exposes us to in terms of our own suffering and capacity for malevolence. And the cure is to consciously and voluntarily accept that and to move forward with it. And there's a paradox in that. And people know this to be true. And you, you can demonstrate it quite straightforwardly by asking people who they admire. Now, you admire people spontaneously, sometimes despite your despite your own desire, let's say. And you admire people, generally speaking, who at least take care of themselves, who aren't a burden to others. I mean, I know there are times in life where people are catastrophically destroyed and they have to rely on others. That isn't what I mean. I mean, you very seldom admire people who abdicate responsibility for themselves. So you admire the contrary. You admire people who are willing to carry themselves properly through life. And then if they're sufficiently uh, expert at that, they can also support others. They can support a family, they can stabilize a family, and if they're good at both of those, they might be able to serve as a true pillar to the community in some noble manner, and maybe they can get all three of those things right. And so that admiration you have for someone you see who's capable of doing that is an indication 
of the manifestation of an instinct that you have to mimic. And so that's also the birth of the origin of the idea of the hero, is that that proclivity to mimic the pattern that stabilizes and, that stabilizes and makes grow. And so you can discover that, and you can discover that in yourself as well, in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, everyone knows, everyone knows that there are things that they say and do that make them smaller and more ashamed. Ashamed of being themselves, ashamed of being human. And that we indulge in those things because, while it's easier or it's um, expedient or more act often because we think we can get away with it, which we absolutely never can. But that diminishes you in your own eyes. And what that means is that you're failing to live up to an implicit ideal that, that's, that dwells within you. And identification of that ideal, articulation of that ideal, and then the embodiment of that ideal is part of adopting the... the the mode of meaningful existence that keeps catastrophic tragedy from corrupting you. And people understand this. They know it's true. So it's a relief <clears throat> to hear it. You know, because we say, well, there's no meaning in life. It's like, well, that's not true. It's, it's incorrect. It's even, I would say it's even psychophysiologically incorrect because this meaning for instinct that I've been describing is instantiated neurophysiologically at multiple levels of brain architecture and not merely at the higher cortical levels. It's an unbelievably deep, deeply layered component of the manner in which you're constructed biologically. And so, you know, for example, I describe meaning in this book as the balance between chaos and order. And there's reasonable neuropsychological evidence that the left hemisphere is specialized roughly speaking, for order, and the right hemisphere is specialized, roughly speaking, for chaos, and that the way you orient yourself in life is by balancing the function of those two subcomponents of your, of your cognitive architecture. And the fact that those hemispheres evolved to reflect reality indicates at some deep level that there is a bifurcation, because otherwise there wouldn't be two hemispheres, and that the domain of order and the domain of chaos have a substantive reality beyond the, beyond the metaphysical. And I think all of that's rock solid, as far as I can tell. And so it's a relief to know it, or at least to start to know it. You used a word which um, you've used many times to define what your book is about and what you want to uh, transmit, which is responsibility. Uh -huh. Telling young people, and not only young people, to assume their responsibility in life. No? But we're watching the world around us and the rise of populism and of easy solutions, and after 50 years of a peace and prosperity in Western world, do you really think people want to assume their responsibility? I mean, well, your, your reasons and the people who follow well, you obviously would, I, are very taken no, I back would say, by this message. I would but say yes, um, based on the response. Um, I think that, you see, the thing is, look, Here's one way of looking at it. So, and this is maybe the, the dark side of the motivation for nihilism. People are nihilistic and they're upset about that because it's very hard on them because they're disoriented and anxious and, and confused and hopeless. And you say, well, why would anyone voluntarily choose that? So then you can play a game, imaginary game, and you could say to two people, or you could say to a person, here, you've got, here's some choices for you. All right, so here's world number one. Nothing you do matters. Your, your nihilism exact, is exactly on par. In a million years, who's going to know the difference? We're on a deadlocked dust spot out in some godforsaken corner of the galaxy. It's all randomness and pointlessness, and, and, and none of it matters a whit. Well, you think, well, that's pretty dreadful. Um, but then you say, but wait, there's an advantage. The advantage is you can do whatever you want. You've got no responsibility because nothing makes any difference. And so, and then you might say, well, maybe you're a nihilist because you want no responsibility. Because you want nothing you do to matter. Because then 
every whim that comes to mind is within your grasp and there's no moral burden. Now, maybe not, but that's certainly worth considering. Then the other alternative would be this. No, you, you don't understand. You are, in fact, the center of something. You're the, you're the bedrock foundation point of the state. You're also central to the structure of reality in, in some fundamental sense, partly because you bring reality into being from potential through your choices. And so you're participating in the creation of reality itself and everything you do matters, everything. And you don't get away with anything because it's all important. It's like, well, you could live in that world too. But then you have the responsibility that goes along with that. Now, you might wonder which choice people would make. But my hope and some of my experience suggests that if the rationale is provided properly, then people will choose the responsible path. And, and there's a reason for that too, because if you choose the nihilistic path, you can make your life devoid of transcendent significance, but you're not going to get rid of the suffering. And you're going to amplify the malevolence. And there's no way out of that. So that's the hell that you're stuck with. And it's real. And people who are stuck there, they know it's real. So if you say, that's real, and there's a way out, sometimes they're desperate enough to try it. And so, and then it works. That's the other thing, is that... We'll see if it works. There's a phrase by Jean-Claude Juncker, who's the, the president of the European Council, and said, you know, we politicians or rulers, we know what we have to do. The problem is that we know that if we do and we say what we should do, people won't vote us. That means yeah. people don't really want... Well, that's a pretty really pathetic want... excuse. Yeah, it, it no, I'm seriously, a... <laughs> that, whole, that whole sequence of sentences, I hear that I from people... Ask you, no, I, yeah. I hear that from people all the time. And in fact, I heard that tw twice from two people that I know that are in the process of changing major institutions, from mm -hmm. two different major institutions. And they, they, the changes are working, and one of them said, well, one of them, we had a talk about why other people weren't doing this, because he seemed to be able to do it. And he said, well, I go and talk to all the people in this organization, and they say, well, we know what to do, and uh, we know how to do it, but it's impossible. It's like, okay, so they don't do it. And so then, literally the same night, I talked to my other friend who's doing the same thing somewhere else, and, and he said, I can't believe the impact that what I've been doing has been, ha what I've been doing has been having. He said, well, why don't other people do this? He said, well, I, I've talked to them, and they say, well, we know what to do, and, and we know how to do it, but it's impossible. <laughs> So then they don't do it. It's like, well, this, this line, it's like, no. What, you have no faith in your citizenry? You can't tell them the truth? Maybe you don't know how to tell the truth. That's a possibility, so they won't vote for you. It's not because they're stupid. It's because you're not capable of uttering the truth in a manner that makes you attractive to people. And so I wouldn't blame the populace. And if you're the sort of person, if you're the sort of politician in a free and democratic society that believes that your constituents can't be trusted with the truth, then you're this far away from... Uh, adopting the attitude of a tyrant. So there's no excuse for that. That's, that's, that's absolutely inexcusable, that sort of statement. Brief, brief question before going into lobsters and, and men and women, <laughs> which I know are the favorite subjects um, tonight and every night. Um, you're going to, well, neuroscience, you've studied it, you, you introduce it in your, your analysis. Um, do you believe in free will? Or are you influenced by theories of Susan Black. Well, I believe in. I Gary believe in. Cohen and well, it, it's 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 free but constrained. I mean, we're not omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Mm -hmm. But yes, I believe that we're not deterministic creatures. There's no evidence for that. In fact, the universe isn't a deterministic place. So I don't even see how it's even conceptually possible for us to be deterministic creatures. Now, there are there is a shift when. So let me show you an action. Okay. Yeah. So if I do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's called a ballistic movement. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's ballistic is that I have to pre-plan it unconsciously before I execute it. Very fast movement. Stop my hand right there. When I start that movement, there isn't enough time for the messages to get from my arm to my brain and back to modify it. So when I decide to release that, that's deterministic. So Who decided to release that? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I decided to release it. 
And who are you? Uh, I guess that remains to be seen. <laughs> um, see, I don't, and I, I, I think that, I don't think that we're driven by the past. I think that we contend with the potential of the future. And I think that you can make a case to the contrary, and people do, and it's reasonable to try to make a deterministic case because it tends to be simpler. But what we know about consciousness, you could put in a thimble. And it looks like what consciousness does essentially from, from a neuropsychological perspective is deal precisely with that that's unpredictable. And so consciousness seems to step in when deterministic systems fail or, or aren't, aren't at hand. Because you don't have to pay attention to anything that you can do by habit. It's what you can't do that you have to pay attention to consciously. And so consciousness seems to build deterministic systems and then we rely on them when we can. But in the dynamic, what, when, in our ongoing dynamic struggle with the transforming future, it's consciousness that is at the forefront. And we don't understand it. And we can, you know, people like Daniel Dennett, for example, attempt to reduce it to an, a materialist epiphenomenon, but like, it's not credible. We don't know enough about the brain, we don't know enough about matter, and we certainly don't know enough about consciousness. Or about God. Or about? God. Well, I wasn't going to bring God up. <laughs> <laughs> lobsters. Okay, lobsters is one of the favorite chapters in the book. I suppose most of you know what all of this is about. Um, but I would like Dr. Peterson to explain the importance of that because it's not just the way lobsters sit and stand. I don't know what female lobsters do, by the way. Oh, they're, they're, they're the quite thing. similar, yeah. They're the same, okay. Yeah. Uh, but it's... They fight for territory and... They fight for Sure, well. because, you know, they don't want to die. Oh, but they don't stand up as straight as they, male they do. Lobsters? They do if they're going to be intimidating. And if they've got serotonin as well. Yes, definitely. Okay. So, um, I would like you to explain... What well, I was making a point. Okay, so is. well, so I was making a point, and it was actually—it's <laughs> so funny because, in some sense, it was actually a pro-leftist point. So, um, so here, here's the situation. So imagine that the first thing we might point out is that there are problems that need to be solved in the world. That that seems obvious, and the evidence for that is excess suffering. Right? Things aren't the way they should be, so we'd like to do something about them, all right? And so maybe someone has an idea about how some problem might be solved, and then that idea has to be implemented in social space. And so you build an organization, you gather people around you, and you gather people around you who are inspired by, let's say, the, the um, opportunity to work on this problem and you all agree that it's a problem worth addressing. Well, so the first thing that happens is that you construct a hierarchy of competence in relationship to ability to solve the problem. And there are rules of productivity that govern how such a hierarchy will be constructed. Uh, the the Predo distribution is the, is the most accurate representation of it. You see this in scientific productivity and, and in in analysis of creative production in virtually every domain. Once you set a goal and you structure a social organization to move towards the goal, then you find that a small proportion of people are far more competent at pursuing the goal than the larger proportion, and they tend to be at the forefront of the organization. And that's how it should be, because if you want to solve the problem, then the logical thing to do is to put the people who can solve the problem in charge of solving the problem, and maybe bring along others and develop them, you know, as it moves forward through time. So you're going to get a hierarchy. And that there's going to be two consequences of that hierarchy. One is that a small proportion of the people in the hierarchy will do the bulk of the creative work. And the second consequence is that a small proportion of the people in the hierarchy will disproportionately benefit from whatever the hierarchy produces. And that, that's why you get, for example, an unequal distribution of money in, in virtually every system you can possibly imagine. And so, that's, that's... But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't create hierarchies. If there are problems and you want to solve them socially, it's an inevitable consequence of doing that. Okay, so, and a, now the conservative types would say, well, we need to support the hierarchies because there they are, useful tools, pursuing useful problems, effective and efficient means of doing that. We need to um, tolerate the inequality produced for the net good. 
And the left wing will say, yeah, but wait a minute. As your hierarchy moves through time, it's going to get increasingly blind and rigid. It's going to get more and more dominated by people who are playing power games rather than are working sheerly on competence. And you have to be concerned about the people who are dispossessed and stack up at the bottom. And that's true. So, so let's take the leftist viewpoint. There's a problem with hierarchies and the problem with hierarchies is the proclivity for dispossession. Now, there's ways of dealing with that. You can have multiple hierarchies. That, a modern society does that. You can have hierarchies that have fair rules of advancement, so that would be equality of opportunity. But the truth of the matter is, is that even if you do all that, you're still going to get people who stack up at the bottom. And that's not good for them. It's not good for their children. And it's not that good for the long-term stability of society. So it has to be addressed. Now, the Marxists, for example, will take that perspective, they say, well, hierarchies privilege and dispossess, and that's the fault of Western culture and capitalism. It's like, no, that's not true. And if you actually want to help the dispossessed, you have to do a much deeper analysis than the Marxists, because there have been hierarchies that dispossess far longer than there has been, well, not only capitalism and the West, but there's been hierarchies that dispossess longer than there have been human beings. And not just a little bit longer, which is why I used the lobsters, for example. So there have been hierarchical structures for 350 million years, at, at minimum. And they're so stable that many of the neurochemical structures and pathways that are used even to track dominance relationships in crustaceans have affinities with the same structures among humans, which shows you how old hierarchies are. A third of a billion years. Now, how are you going to blame that on capitalism and the West? Now, if you're really concerned about the dispossessed, you're going to take the problem of hierarchies a lot more serious than the Marxists. Especially because we also know that even if you set up a Marxist paradise, and bloody well, good luck with that, I'll say, that you're, going, you're not going to produce a society that has less inequality. You're going to produce a society that, in fact, has more inequality and less wealth. The one thing you can say about capitalism and the West is that along with the inevitable inequality produced by hierarchies, we managed to produce a certain modicum of wealth and lifted the bottom end out of absolute dreadful poverty. And that's something, and it's something that's accelerating around the world. So, so that was the first part. The second part was, well, you know, I described a little bit about what constitutes a confident lobster, but mostly to indicate that that was a, a secondary consequence of increased serotonin production. And that if a lobster was defeated, then the serotonin levels would decline, and you could fix that with antidepressants, which is a stunning example of biochemical continuity across you know, the eons. But then there was a bit of a meditation in that chapter on what it is that constitutes human hierarchies. And it isn't dominance that constitutes human hierarchies if they're functioning properly. It's competence. And that's a completely different thing. And competence is multifaceted. So, for example, if you're competent at doing something, imagine you're a competent plumber. Okay, and you might think, well, one of the preconditions, you're part of the plumbing, the patriarchal tyranny of plumbers. And so, well, yeah, these things get ridiculous if you use, like, high-resolution examples. Well, the first thing you have to do if you're a plumber is, well, hypothetically, you have to be able to fix pipes. That would be, like, precondition number one, because if you can't, well, you're going to get a reputation for being a useless plumber, and then you're not going to have a plumbing operation. But that's not all you have to do, right? You, you think if you're going to run a plumbing business successfully, or maybe a plumbing empire, for that matter, well, you have to... You have to deal fairly with your customers. You have to charge them what you promised you'd charge them, and that has to be reasonable for the job, so they have to trust you. You have to arrange things with your employees so that they're pleased enough to be working with you so they stay with you and develop their skills and also provide the services that are necessary. You have to do that over a long period of time, and you have to do it in a manner that allows the entire structure to grow. And so that means that you have to embody a particular kind of ethic that transcends mere, the mere technical skill, and that means you have to embody a certain mode of being in order to be successful in that manner. And that was the mode of being that I was trying to point to in chapter one, which was 
Well, to stand up straight with your shoulders back isn't to adopt a stance of tyrannical power towards the world. It's to, it's to, it's to manifest courage even as, mani- even as reflected in your posture that you're willing to expose yourself voluntarily to the trouble of existence and to manifest the necessary existential courage to put yourself together and that that's actually the most stable solution to success in human hierarchies. And that's the case. I mean, the idea that our society, for example, is fundamentally a tyrannical patriarchy, first of all, is the ignorant misuse of what's essentially a symbolic idea and second, an, an absolute falsehood. It's not like our hierarchical systems are perfect and they do tilt towards tyranny and blindness. We have to be awake to prevent that from happening. But fundamentally, in our functional cultures, most people play a straight game and they play a straight game across long periods of time and that actually turns out to be a much more stable means of attaining hierarchical position than use of anything as arbitrary as power or tyranny. Even in chimpanzees, the tyrant chimps tend to meet a pretty vicious end and they're nowhere near as sophisticated socially as human beings. And so, well, so that's what that chapter is about. It's like hierarchies dispossess, they, the people who are dispossessed need a voice, that's the proper voice of the left. The proper way forward through life is courageous encounter with vulnerability, the ability to stand up and take that on as a burden, and that's the most effective way of manifesting success in the long term in the hierarchical structures that human beings create. So, and I think all of that is, as far as I'm concerned, that's rock solid. So. But you know, 20% of social scientists identify themselves as Marxist. Yeah, well, and, you know. And um, what you call social warriors have become extremely powerful in the debate between, well, they say there is a debate, the world is divided between the oppressed and the oppressors. So when did that start? I mean, oh, that's 1970s France, you've talked yeah. about many times. Yeah. But why has it become such a powerful force in well, it's always years. it's always been there in the form of envy. I mean, one of the stories that I take apart in Twelve Rules for Life is the story of Cain and Abel, which is the story of victimizer and victim, and and the homicidal consequences of playing that game. And so, the idea that life is unfair and that unfairness is directed primarily at you, and it's directed at you by someone for whom life is what skewed in an unreasonably positive direction. That's, well, that's, you could say that's the oldest story of humanity. So Marxism would be an extremely natural phenomenon? Yeah, it, it, this, this, this story, this, and it is the story of Cain and Abel, manifests itself in different guises, in different places, I would say, throughout the entire course of human history. And with regards to one in five social scientists identifying as a Marxist, you know, there's this professor, I think his name is Wolf, um, he put a challenge up on YouTube to me a couple of weeks ago to debate him. And um, what did he tell, what did he say? He said, he, he criticized my criticism of Marx. He said, well, at Peterson, you know, he's basically stuck in 1989. It's like, we've progressed way past the time of the Stalinists. It's like, and I thought, well, how about if a Nazi said that? Just out of curiosity. It's like, well, it's not 1945, you know, anymore. It's like, us national socialists, we've, We've progressed way past what happened in Nazi Germany. It's like, we should just, for, don't be stuck in the past, right? It's time to give us another chance. It's like, well, how about no? How about, how about, how about uh, well, we have the Soviet Union with the 20 million dead there, and we have Mao's China with God only knows how many people were killed there, and we have Cambodia, we have Vietnam, and Venezuela isn't looking that great, by the way, and Cuba can't feed itself, and that's just a smattering of... Marxist catastrophes, it's like, well, how much evidence do you need, exactly? And, and, and here's also what I think about modern Marxists. This is what they think. First of all, they think they're driven by compassion, and they're not, because they're not saints. And second, what they truly believe is, well, you know, everyone so far that's implemented Marxism, they weren't really the true acolyte of Marx that I am. They didn't have the real insight into the Marxist 
philosophy that I do. If I would have been running the Soviet Union, instead of Stalin, I would have ushered in the communist utopia. When the truth of the matter was, is that had you been a genuinely compassionist, compassionate Marxist in 1915, your head would have been among the first on the chopping block. You can be absolutely certain of that. So, I don't buy any of it, and I don't understand for the life of me why it's any more permissible in polite society to proclaim proudly that you're a Marxist after the absolute catastrophe of the 20th century than it is to claim that you're a national socialist. So, that's how it looks to me. I'm no fan of left-wing collectivists, or those on the right for that matter. I'll talk so. about that in, an, in, a, in a moment. Um, it's probably because they have what is called the monopolio de los sentimientos. The mono, monopolio? How would you say that? Monopoly, no, that sounds a bit weird. Um, they have the control or the, the dominance over, over feelings, no? That's, that's where the left... Well, it's a mask of compassion. It's, it's like, well, I'm, I'm for the poor. Saying. It's like, yeah, sure you are. <laughs> it's not that easy to be for the poor. It's not that easy, you know, and one of the things that's worth reflecting on, for example, is that, you know, there, there's, there's antipathy generated towards the 1%, you know, because, well, I already pointed out that in, in systems of productivity, as Marx did point out, um, a vast proportion of what's produced goes to a relatively small minority of people. That's, that's definitely the case. But, like, where do you draw the line exactly? It's so, like, you're a modern Western Marxist, right? And you're concerned about the 1%. It's like, you know what? How much money you need to make per year to be among the top 1% in the world? It's $32,000. So, everyone in the West is part of the 1%. It's like, so what? What? We're all on the chopping block? Or no? We, or do, what do we do? We, divide, we decide that there's an arbitrary border within which we're going to calculate that. And that turns out to be conveniently the case that the despicable rich are those people who have more money than me. <laughs> so, and you see this too in Ivy League schools, for example, in the United States, where the students are protesting, you know, the oppressive, tyrannical patriarchy. And I think, well, what the hell do you think you're part of, you 18-year-olds at... <laughs> at Yale. It's like, you know, you're, you're already, you're, just because you're baby patriarchal tyrants, it doesn't mean that you're not in the game, you're completely in the game. Harvard, I mean, I was there for six years, Harvard treated its undergraduates extraordinarily well. And the reason for that is that they knew that 40% of them, and this was quite a while ago, would, be, would have a net worth of over a million dollars by the time they were 40. And so they didn't think about them as oppressed 18-year-olds, they thought them, about them as extraordinarily rich people who just didn't have their money yet. And so if you're part of an Ivy League, especially an Ivy League institution, and you think you're not part of the patriarchal tyranny for what that's worth, then, well, what you know, what you don't know about the world would take Ivy League professors more than four years to teach you, especially the way they teach you now. Did you read Piketty's book? Piketty's book. I haven't read it yet, no. Okay, <laughs> fine. Um, in this uh, tyrannical patriarchy, of course, who's at the top? Men. Some men. White men. Uh, well, White, that's another rich, thing. It's like Saxon men. Well, first of all, it depends on which element of the hierarchy you look at, and second of all, it's not men. Okay, it's a tiny percentage of men, and that's not the same as men. Because most men aren't at the top. In fact, if you look at people who are truly at the bottom, most of them are men. So, it's a small proportion of men. And then, it's a very arbitrary slice. It's like, okay, so you're saying, well, what are we saying exactly? The, the, there's a disproportionate number of white Anglo-Saxon men who are billionaires. Could easily be. Um, what does that have to do with men, exactly? Why is that a male thing? It's, like, it's not like all these men are like that. They're, they're, not, they're not like that. It's a tiny proportion of people who are like that, and they do happen to mostly be men. And, but th that doesn't indicate some fundamental inadequacy in the entire social structure. I mean, 99% of bricklayers are men. Mm -hmm. is, is that a problem? Well, nobody ever points it out. Like, all you have to do is go on the U.S. Department of Labor website and you can look at occupation ranked by gender. 
there's about 50 occupations that are 95% men and, and over. You don't ever hear a word about them. Well, why? Because they're dusty, grueling, difficult, trade-related, intensely laborious outside jobs. Well, that's why. So, and, and why aren't we struggling for equality, um, gender equality among bricklayers? By force, let's say, from here on in, it's by fiat, man. 50% of women, they want to be nurses, no damn way. It's off to the brickworks with you. <laughs> Then, these men that are at the top, you imagine, well, what are, what are the traits that you need to, to enter that domain, let's say, of, of, of overwhelming economic influence? Well, there's a certain amount of luck that's associated with it, like, it's helpful to be physically healthy, because otherwise you won't have the stamina. So, be good if you were born at the 95th percentile or above in terms of cognitive ability. And that's like luck of the draw, because a huge part of cognitive ability is genetically predicated, especially as we make sure everyone is properly nourished, the proportion of variability and in intelligence that's due to genetic factors actually increases. So, it's helpful to be born smart. In fact, it's actually better in Western societies, by the time you're age 40, to be born at the 95th percentile for intelligence than it is to be born at the 95th percentile for wealth. So that's quite interesting. So you have to be 1 in 20 minimum for intelligence. Then you probably have to be 1 in 20 or maybe 1 in 30 for conscientiousness. And those two traits are uncorrelated. So you're down to about 1 in 600 right there. And then you have to be absolutely obsessed with what you're doing because the people who are in the C-suites, the vast majority of them, and this is the same for hyperproductive engineers and for hyperproductive scientists, anybody who's hyperproductive in the, in the true sense, artists as well, they're absolutely 100% obsessed with what they do. All they do is work, all the time. And not only do they work all the time, while they're working, they're trying to figure out how to make their work even more productive than it already is. And no matter where you put people like that, and they're in a minority, then that's what they're going to do. So they're very rare people. And then you might say, well, why are more of them men than women? Well, it's because women are more likely to take time at about the time when their career would explode to have a family. Now, not all women, but many women. And I don't see that that's the wrong choice. Now, I've worked with really high-performing women, mostly in law firms in Canada. And so these were women who were partners in senior law firms. And they were unbelievably desirable to their law firms because I worked with people who were recommended by their law firms as their top producers. So the deal was, send us your top producers, we'll make them even more productive. But we work for them, not you. And so then I would do oh, sometimes strategic planning and sometimes marital counseling and sometimes I'd just listen and whatever the person needed in order to... Or sometimes I had helped people figure out how to take vacations because they were billing like 2,400 hours a year and they were working 16 hours a day and they were burning themselves out and they couldn't reduce their weekly workload but they could take three days off every two months and then, then actually their productivity increased. Like there were lots of different strategies. But what happened in the law firms was that they all lost all their women in their 30s. And the reason was the women hit partnership and they were like high achieving people and very valuable because they were also the people who were bringing revenue into the firm. So if you want to be a high end lawyer, you have to be a really good lawyer, but that's not good enough. You have to be a really good lawyer who can really sell legal work and man, those people are rare because that's, that's the product of two rare traits. And so the law firms were absolutely desperate to keep their the women who could do that, but they all left. Why? They hit about 30, and they looked around at all the other partners, and they thought, do I really want to be working 75 hours a week on call for the next 40 years with these characters? Or do I want to have a life? And the answer was, oh, I've got enough money, I'm doing fine, I'm married to someone who's making a decent living, we're, we're, not, in, we're not suffering from any economic privation. Why don't I step back and work a reasonable workload? 30 hour, 5 hours a week, 40 hours a week, take a vicious hit and pay, but whatever, then I can have a relationship, I can have a family, I can have a life. It's like, that doesn't require explanation. That's what a normal person does. What it requires explanation is the crazy guy who thinks, no bloody way, man, I'm going to lock myself up in my lab and I'm going to work 80 hours a week till I die. 
And there's a small proportion of people who do that. They're hyperproductive and good for them because they invent almost everything. But it's not something that you can expect. It's true. Like, you think everyone's creative. It's like, no, they're not. <laughs> look, look, I'm dead serious about this. It's complete, it's complete bloody rubbish. So we invented this questionnaire called the Creative Equ Achievement Questionnaire, and it's, it's used as a standard psychometric instrument in the creativity literature. And so what we did was we identified 13 different domains of creativity. So every domain you could think of, architectural, um, in, in, inventive, entrepreneurial, um, gastronomic, uh, uh, visual arts, dance, literature, you, you name it, you know, maybe there was more than 13, but we, we got 13 and that was enough. And then we rank ordered achievement within each realm from zero to 10, with zero being I have no recognized training or talent in this area, to 10 being I'm an international superstar in this domain. And so then we gave it to thousands of people, and this has been used all over the world. The median score across all 13 categories is zero. 70% of the people who fill out the Creative Achievement Questionnaire score zero. And the next most common score is one. And that takes care of like 80% of people. Then you have this tiny group of outliers who are way out on the distribution, Pareto distribution, who score like 50. And so, yeah, those are the creative people. And they're probably not you. Now, they might, well, how many people here have, have painted a picture that hangs in a national gallery? None. How many people here have, have, have written a symphony? Look, none. Hmm. How many people here have painted a full oil painting? Okay, so there's like six. Okay, how many of you have painted ten oil paintings? Okay, so there's about four. Do you know how many Picasso painted? <laughs> 65,000. Three a day, every day for 60 years. See, that's because Picasso was creative. So, well, so that's the way the world works, unfortunately. And so... I can understand young men that. feeling very encouraged by you. <laughs> yeah. They are. Um, you suggest that we're forcing, we have forced, um, and I think that's true, a masculine model onto women, paradoxically. Radical feminism is forcing a, ma a masculine model onto women, saying that all women should want to work hard, earn lots of money, have top careers, etc., which, if they believe there's a patriarchy, that would oh, be what's oh. been installed. It's weird, that's a weird thing. It's a weird maybe, thing. Maybe if you have the patriarchy, yeah. But you fill it with women, then it's no longer a tyranny. Yeah. <laughs> well, that seems to be the idea. Although, then that you don't know if the, the tyranny idea. is the men or if it's the structure. Like, if it's mm -hmm. the structure, I don't see how filling it with women I is going to help. I'm sorry. Must be men. Yeah, yeah I think that's I think probably right. But the other, on the other hand, so we're forcing, I, I agree with that, a, um, a masculine model onto women. And the fact is, as you've quoted many times, uh, there are studies that show that in new um, gender-neutral societies, uh, the differences are larger and larger between choices and interests. For and example, in Holland, which is very egalitarian, uh, more women ask for part-time jobs because yeah. they freely choose to spend their afternoons with their kids. So radical feminists would say, ooh, naughty, that's really bad because you should be striving for a career and a work and a job. So it's bizarre because we're not accepting an alternative, more feminine model as something well, that is accepted, that is defendable it's really, it's and really, positive. It's really strange because, first of all, most people don't have careers. Mm -hmm. They have jobs. Jobs. Okay, and those aren't the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might be one of those fortunate people who have a career, but even among people who have careers, The, the, the probability that the person who has that career is going to find their fundamental fulfillment within that career is relatively low. Mm -hmm. So, as a model for what you should strive for in life, it's, it's a pretty weak one. But, but it, it's also paradoxical in that, well, if the patriarchal structure is the problem, why in the world would you put success in that why would you elevate success in that to the predominant value? 
Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. You know, and mm -hmm. one of the things that we teach 19-year-old women, which I think is appalling, is that fundamentally your career is going to be the most important thing in your life. It's like, mm -hmm. no, it's not. It's not the most important thing in most people's lives. And so, and, and for good reason. I mean, and part of the reason, if you have a job, the reason people pay you is because you wouldn't choose to do it. That's, that's kind of a hint, you know, in some sense. And so if you're one of those people who is fortunate enough to combine vocation with, with, with income, well, good for you, but geez, that's, that's pretty damn rare. It, it, it's the odd entrepreneur or creative person who can pull that off, but it's very, very rare. So it's a lie as far as I'm concerned because most people realize, especially as they get older, that most of what satisfies them, what they find deeply satisfying about life is, well, is... Love, I would say, is, is they have a good, maybe they have a good marriage. That's certainly something. They have kids and their kids are really, you know, you have kids and all of a sudden there are people in the world that are more important than you. That's really something. And so you have your kids and they get more important to you as you get older, I think. I mean, maybe not because they're pretty important to begin with, but they certainly seem to, as I've got older, and I've had a stellar career, I would say, in terms of its if it's re the rewards that it's delivered to me, it's like, I, w I would by no means say that in, in my scheme of things that it takes priority over my wife and my kids in terms of what's made my life rich and valuable. And so, I don't know why we're selling this bill of goods precisely. It's like, Somebody it's a mystery. Somebody as, as little suspicious of being a sort of big mama as Camille Paglia, um, wrote recently, or spoke in a conference, I think, saying, you know, we're not allowing young, bright, intelligent university girls in their 20s to actually want to even contemplate the idea of having children soon in their lives. And um, it's true that it, is, it, it, is, it does give women an extra responsibility and also freedom of choice, which, of course, men don't have. And if responsibility ranks very high, which it does apparently to you, does to me, does to certain people. Well, that's something that we women have that men don't. But I was going to ask you about um, going back to the, to the boys thing, which is um, particularly important now. All this toxic masculinity speech that is going around, men as aggressive, um, beings, which, which they are. Men are more aggressive, aren't they? That's why there are more of them in prison. Yeah. And more male that victims. That is why. It's ten, it's ten to one. Yeah. And the, the reason for that is it's mostly trade agreeableness. Women are higher in trade agreeableness than men. And the best personality predictor of incarceration is low agreeableness. And so men, men and women are pretty similar in terms of agreeableness. So that if you took a random man and a random woman out of the population, and you bet that the woman was more aggressive, so less agreeable, you'd be right 40% of the time. So the differences aren't immense, but it doesn't matter because the, the real crucial difference is at the extremes. And so even though the distributions overlap to a great degree, if you go three, three standard deviations or four standard deviations out from the population mean, and you pick the most aggressive person out of 100, they're all men then you just throw them in prison. So, and, and that's why the incarceration rate among men is so much higher. And so you can get walloping differences in outcome as a consequence of relatively trivial differences at the average level. And so, I, you know, we're not trying to equalize that as well, which is probably just as well, since you probably want to put dangerous criminals in jail and not just aggressive women, let's say. So. But let's say that the standards are changing to such a degree that, um, for example, in Spain, case study, laws against sexual violence have different punishment if you're a woman than if you're a man. What do you think about that? And believe the victim idea, which is also running very well, strongly and presumption believe of Believe the innocence. accuser. I mean, it, if you believe that the Western common law tradition or its variants is fundamentally a manifestation of the patriarchal tyranny, then you can also believe that the presumption of innocence is a patriarchal plot. And if you believe that, then you can move to a system that uses preponderance of evidence. And, 
and you can move to a system where you automatically believe the accuser. It's like, well, go ahead. See what happens if you do that. Because you're going to find that not everyone who's an accuser is, huh, what would you say? If you don't think that the power of accusation can be used in a malevolent fashion, then your eyes aren't very open and you haven't lived very long. And so, and that doesn't mean that I believe that the majority of women who bring allegations of sexual assault are in fact doing that. That's not the point. The point is, is that it, it's a hell of a thing for us to have invented the presumption of innocence. It flies in the face of the innate human desire to mob together and burn. But we managed it. And it's something unbelievably precious, and it's something that protects each of us, that presumption of innocence. You know, we even have a hard time applying that to ourselves. When I have clients that come in to see me, often they're tilted a bit towards negative emotion, and so they're terribly guilty about things that they've done. And it's really eating them up. And it's like they've got this internal tyrant in them that's just grinding them into bits. And the first thing I do is say, well, why don't you make, let's make a defense for yourself. Why don't we presume for a moment, just for the sake of argument, that you're innocent of what you're convicting yourself for? I mean, maybe you're not, but you deserve a defense. And so then we talk about that, or I have them write it out. It's like, why might this self-accusation be incorrect? You know, because you deserve, the, don't you, the benefit of the doubt? You know, imperfect as you are, and no one's completely innocent, and of course then when people are accused, they, ob they almost immediately assume that they're guilty. You see this when people get mobbed eh, online. The first thing they do is they think, oh my God, a thousand people think I'm horrible. I probably am. I'm probably horrible, which is what you'd expect someone who wasn't psychopathic to think, right? Because with that much pressure, it's time to ask yourself a question or two. But to immediately capitulate and to apologize abjectly means that you've foregone the defense of the presumption of innocence. It's like... You've got you to write to a defense along with all the other wretched people in the world. No doubt you've made your mistakes, so has everyone else. But, you know, the fact that you have intrinsic value as an individual means in our societies, functional as they are, that you have the right to the best defense that can be mustered for you. And now we're setting up these quasi-judicial boards of inquiry in universities to prosecute charges of sexual assault without any of the legal guarantees that are part and parcel of the normative judicial system and using preponderance of evidence as the new standard. It's like, man, you gotta watch that, you know. These things, these, these tilts and twists in the legal system that move you away from these fundamental standards, they don't go everywhere at once when they flip. They start in local places and spread. And they're already nicely instantiated in the universities, which, by the way, were never set up to be quasi-judicial boards of inquiry to regulate the sexual behavior of their students. It's like, I can't see... How can universities do that? They can hardly even do what they're supposed to do, let alone that. So... Uh. What are the reasonable limits? <laughs> Just there. What would be the reasonable limit to the freedom of speech? Well, there are reasonable limits that are already in place. So Incitement right. to crime, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Um, direct credible threat, which, you know, which basically mm -hmm. falls under the same category. And then there's, there's precedents that have been established over centuries that regulate freedom of speech. So, but but you, want, you want minimal regulation of freedom of speech. You want minimal regulation of freedom of speech, and this, this is essentially why. So, I already made a case for the existence of the left, right? The left has to speak for the dispossessed, okay? And the right speaks for hierarchies. Now, there's, there's more to it than that, but it's not a bad first-pass approximation. And the truth of the matter is, sometimes the hierarchies have got rigid and exclusionary and need a good tap from the left, and sometimes they've got weak and malfunctioning and they need some buttressing from the right. And you don't know when that is because it changes. And so how do you figure out when it is? And the answer is people of different temperaments argue about it. 
So if you're high in openness, which is a trait, and relatively low in conscientiousness, another trait, you're going to be liberal left, you're going to be on the side of the dispossessed. And if you're high in conscientiousness and low in openness, then you're going to be more likely to be on the side of the conservatives and the right. And sometimes the right is correct and sometimes the left is correct. And the only way that you can figure out where the proper line is, is by letting people hash it out. And they do that with free dialogue. And so that's the mechanism that keeps society properly oriented. And so you don't want to constrain that mechanism because that's the mechanism by which we negotiate instead of fighting. Okay, now, the problem with the, with the radical left types is that you can't even talk to them about free speech because they don't believe it exists. It's, it isn't that they think that free speech should be regulated more heavily, it's that they believe the concept itself is flawed. Because A, there are no individuals, there are just identity groups. So if you have an opinion, you don't have an opinion because there isn't any you. You're a mouthpiece for your group identity. And if you happen to be a victimizer group, then all you're using your capacity for speech for is to justify the tyrannical power structure that you happen to occupy as someone who's privileged. And there's no dialogue between you and the victim because dialogue assumes that two individuals of goodwill, and so there's no individuals and there's no goodwill because it's all power, could actually have a conversation and reach some sort of, um, what would you call, mediated and negotiated con solution, conclusion. Well, that doesn't exist within the collectivist framework, that way of looking at the world. So it's not a debate about limits on free speech, it's a debate about the conceptual validity of the idea of free speech itself. It's a much more fundamental assault. The added problem to collectivism and um, demanding collective rights is what happens with collective responsibilities. Well, th this is, look, first of all, collectives don't suffer, mm -hmm. individuals do. And yeah, who are you going to hold responsible? Like, for every right, there's a commensurate responsibility. Like, your rights are my responsibilities. That's how it works. They're, they're mirror images of one another. It's like, okay, groups have rights. All right, fine. How are you going to hold them responsible? Well, the Soviets held groups responsible, yeah. right? I mean, there, I, I, I wrote in, I just wrote the preface for the 50th anniversary version of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, the abridged version. And I found a lovely quote in there by George Latsis, who was writing for a magazine called Red Terror. There's a lovely magazine for you. I mean, <laughs> you got, they got the metaphor right even, right? Because the red is obviously a nice reference to blood. And so what Latsis said, if you're interrogating an enemy of the people, you don't give any consideration to bourgeois niceties like their individual guilt or innocence because that whole concept doesn't, that's just a bourgeois conceit. What you want to know is their class, their race, their ethnicity, their background. And if they fit the wrong category, well, then you take the proper corrective action. And there was plenty of proper corrective action taken, including the eventual execution of George Latsis. And I thought, I read that because someone wrote me after I wrote the uh, forward and said, you know, Latsis was executed later by the Stalinists. And I thought, well, there's a classic case of putting the noose around your own neck and kicking the chair over. It's like you set the preconditions up for that. If you don't think you're going to be devoured by that, you're, and here's why. So, the intersectionalists, say, eh? geniuses that they are, hypothetically, have cottoned on to something, and, and that's this. It's like, well, let's say you're, you're black, or you're Latino, oh, that, that awkward grouping that's used in the United States. Um, well, then you're, you're, maybe you're oppressed. It depends on who you're being compared to, I suppose, but then that's a very critical issue. You're oppressed. Fair enough. But, wait a second, you have more than one group identity. Well, maybe you're, you're, you're Latino and you're female. It's like, oh, well now you're oppressed along two dimensions, and so your oppression is either the sum of those two identities or the product of them. I don't know what the mathematical calculation is precisely, but it's, it's one of those two things. So, well then, what if you're disabled? Well, you are in some manner, you can be sure of that. Well, what if you're old? What if, what if you come from a poor family? You know, so you can continue to multiply these canonical group identities and you can certainly keep multiplying them to the point where all you've got in each category is the individual, which is what the West figured out about 4,000 years ago. But in any case, here's the fundamental problem. 
It's more important to determine whether you're a victimizer than a victim. Because your benevolent existence as a victim is nowhere near as benevolent, benevolent as your malevolent existence as a victimizer. And if you have five group identities, which you certainly do, I'm sure I can find one dimension along which you're a victimizer. And as soon as I discover that, then, well, it's off to the gulag with you. And so if you want to, I mean, you can come up with your own theory if you want. The, the red terror that constituted the Russian Revolution was hypothetically motivated by compassionate for the, compassion for the dispossessed. And, you know, maybe back in 1914, that was a reasonable stance because no one knew for sure what the horrors of full-fledged Marxism would look like, although people had warned about it. Dostoevsky had warned about it. Nietzsche had warned about it in no uncertain terms. But you could still say, well, and Nietzsche actually said, maybe we have to run the experiment just to demonstrate to ourselves how it will turn out. Okay, well, the experiment was run. It's like there's some dimension along which you're an oppressor. So you better watch out for the oppressor-oppressed narrative. Because if you think you're going to be on the, on the beneficiary of the victim side, you've got another thing coming. Especially when you also have to understand that maybe there are people who are primarily motivated by compassion, compassion for the poor. I've met damn few of them in my life. It requires a certain saintly uh, attitude towards existence that very few people can manage. But there's certainly a certain number of people who are motivated by resentment and jealousy of anyone that they think has anything more than they do in terms of ability or skill or, or perhaps material possessions. And so I would say the scales tilt towards those who are willing to take revenge. And so even if 20% of the, even if 20 of the revolutionaries are compassionate, you can be bloody sure they're going to be devoured instantly by the 80% who aren't. And that's exactly what happened in places like the Soviet Union. And so if you think that wouldn't happen again, well then you think that if you were running the system it would turn out better. And then you're definitely part of the problem and not part of the solution. So... We don't have much time, but um, I do want to make another few questions. One of them is um, your take on the left-wing collectivism has made your critics side you on a an alt-right group and a kind of right-wing collectivism. When we're obviously in the middle, not just of culture wars, but identity wars, especially in the US, but, but not only. Micro-collectivism versus macro-collectivism, if you want. Small groups on the left and big groups, Trump on the right. So I wanted to ask, you know, is that right-wing collectivism, that America first and in many European versions, as dangerous? as a left-wing collectivism? Well, it can be, and it has been in the past. I mean, any, any um, movement that privileges the group over the individual has the proclivity to, to degenerate into a kind of murderous tribalism. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so my battle fundamentally so far has been with the left-wing collectivists because, well, I come, came out of the universities and, and, and they were having... At, at the time that I made my first videos in Canada, were having a disproportionate effect on Canadian legislation. Mm -hmm. And the, the identitarian right in Canada, it's like you could put all those people into a, I don't know, into a small hotel room. Mm -hmm. Like there just aren't any of them, you know. So in, in my country, that's that just more in the US. Yes, although it's complicated in the US because Trump is by no means a classic um, right winger. I mean, I don't know what the hell Trump is, Not but. No. Well, I'm serious. Like, I mean, he's, a, he's an anomalous, he's an anomalous person, he, right? He's a nationalist. He's a, yeah, he's he's a collectivist. A, well, he's definitely a nationalist, and he certainly does believe that, uh, he does believe that his country comes first. He's, he's, he's not fond of the transnational globalist scheme of, of, of what? Of, of world representation. But that's a caricature, isn't it? Of classical liberal liberalism. It's a caricature that he makes, or his people make, of what classical liberalism is about. The individual. What you've been defending. I mean, if we're against left-wing collectivism, it's the same on, on the right. It doesn't really, it's not even a left-right thing anymore. I mean, they are very much the same in the essence of things, which is putting the group Yes, yes, yes. Well, that, that, that continuum, I, uh, that, that distribution idea is a mm -hmm. rather weak theoretical model because the, the opposites tend to touch. Yeah. And so I don't know exactly how to conceptualize that like 
imagistically. It's not, it's not self-evident. But you, you definitely get collectivist tendencies on, you get the ethno-national collectivist mm -hmm. tendencies. And so it's sort of, it's sort of the left collectivism is, um, well, groups are at war and we need to, we need to deprivilege the privilege and, and re-privilege the underprivileged. And the right wing says, no, no, we'll just take our privileges and, and burn the whole place down if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, neither of those approaches are approaches that I believe are, that they, they're, neither of those approaches lead anywhere except to terrible places. And so that's why, to the degree that I've been able to, I've been stressing the responsibility of the individual because the way that the West determined how to avoid that, what, that tension of opposites mm -hmm. was to put the individual first and say, it's your responsibility to keep the state in order. And you do that by putting your house in order first. And if enough individuals put their house in order and act in the manner that is required of someone who is genuinely the foundation bedrock of the state, then it won't oscillate so badly that it will collapse. And I think that that's the case. I think that works. And so, as, as far as I'm concerned, and this is partly why I've been going around the world lecturing, I mean, there's an audience for it, I'm trying to convince people to, well, to take on the burden of their responsibility in the face of their suffering, and to become the sort of people who will not be tempted by the blandishments of the radicals on the left or the right. And I mean, I've really been trying to do that since 1987, when I figured some of what I've been talking about online out. I thought when I was studying collect collectivist catastrophes, the collectivist catastrophes of the 20th century, both the fascist and the, and the communist catastrophes, one thing that kept standing out to me, and maybe it's because I have a psychological bent, was that these totalitarian states with their absolute abject murderousness couldn't have come about if the individuals within those societies hadn't abdicated their fundamental sovereign responsibilities. And the abdication took two forms. One was com direct complicitness, right, to act actually participate in the totalitarian processes and the atrocities themselves. And the other was turning a blind eye when they knew perfectly well it was no longer time to turn a blind eye. And so that was a sin of omission. And I learned from my studies of mythology that even ancient cultures like, like ancient Egypt had recognized that that proclivity to turn the blind eye was an invitation to totalitarian sovereignty. Like we've, we'd figured that out for 4,000 years ago. I mean, the Egyptians had a god, Osiris, who was the god of the state. And he was overthrown by his evil brother, Seth, who's a mythological precursor to Satan. He was overthrown by Seth because Osiris turned a willfully blind eye to the machinations of his evil brother. And so the Egyptians had this figured out literally thousands of years ago. Well, it's the same thing now. And so it's the sovereign duty of individual citizens to pay attention and to keep things from deviating too far. And so you do that in part through dialogue with your own conscience. It's like, well, maybe the collectivists are putting a little bit of pressure on you at work. You know, like maybe at, in the UC system, in the United States, for example. Now, if you want to be a professor, you have to formulate and sign a diversity, inclusivity, and equity statement. Well, how about no? Right? If 20 people, if 20 credible people in that system said there's no bloody way I'm formulating that and signing it, it would come to a halt. But, you know, people think, well, it's okay. It's like, no, it's not. It's not even a little bit okay. You just give away a little bit of your soul. It's like, if you've got soul to spare, give it away. But I, I wouldn't recommend it, because if you give away enough of it, there won't be anything left of you except what's capable of suffering terribly. And perhaps capable of suffering terribly enough to also become malevolent. And so you write what you don't believe at your absolute peril. And if you think that, that that's justified by your career seeking, then you have the cart before the horse. Because you'll end up with a career that no one in their right mind would want. 
And so, well, we each have to make decisions like that. And I've talked to academics, you know, they've come and said to me, look, you know, I've worked, I've finished my thesis, I've done my work, I, I have a shot at this job, if I don't sign the statement, if I don't write the statement, it's worse. It's not that you have to just sign the bloody thing. You have to write it. And then they give you some guidelines about how to write it. So it's like, well, it won't hurt. It's like, yes, it will. You, you, you pathologize your speech at your immortal peril. And if you think your job is worth it, go ahead. But you're going to find out that what you gave up was something you're not going to be able to get back. And besides that, you tilt the whole society in a very bad direction. So, you know, one of the things you all should be learning in university is don't give up your sovereign speech. If you're, I mean, that's what you're here to learn, right? You're, learn, you're here to learn how to articulate yourselves carefully, thoughtfully, so that you become unstoppable, because you are unstoppable if you could do that. And if you're doing things like, well, I need to write this essay in the manner that will please the professor, or I won't get the grade that I need, then you've, 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 lost your ed you've lost your education right there. The university is doing you far more harm than good. You don't sacrifice your integrity. There'll, be, there'll come a time in your life, I, I'm, this is a dead serious warning, from someone who's got 25,000 hours of clinical experience. There will come a time in your life where you have to make a decision. And if you make the wrong decision, you're done. And the only thing that you'll have to guide that decision is your integrity. And if you've sacrificed it, you'll make the wrong decision. And then heaven help you. So. so. With um, this call for responsibility, and also for the use of clear, precise, clean, elegant, not necessarily succinct language. Um, I think we can call this an evening. Uh, and just two, two very quick questions. Quick questions. Okay. I mean that. Um, quick answers, I presume. Quick answers. You my, questions, <laughs> my questions are very quick. Yeah. Quick answers. Um, what's your next book about? Well, at the moment, the working title is Beyond Mere Order, 12 More Rules for oh, Life. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and I think I'm going to, grandma. Print, this I'm is going going to grandma. print it in black. <laughs> so. uh, and the other thing is, when, when are you going to stop just eating meat? Well, as soon as I'm able, because it's not the world's most exciting diet. I know. You know, so... Um, I'm not sh sure what it's I... Not, it's not just a provocation on, on, on vegans and No, I mean, that, that's a nice additional feature, but... Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I, w I would... I mean, it's very dull and, and difficult, mm. especially when you're traveling, but... Um, I don't know what I won't react catastrophically to, and I don't have the time to experiment with a month's worth of, of, of serious illness. So this works, and while it, it's working, I can do these sorts of things. And so for now, I'm just sticking with what I'm doing, even though it's, you know, well. More exciting times will come. His stake is waiting. Uh, big round of applause for Dr. Jordan Peterson. Thank you.